speak on behalf of the Mars Association and the expedition to Mars, which will be departing in one week's time. And here with me, I have the head astronaut, Glenn Coco, which will be speaking on behalf of all of the attempts to discredit this expedition. Hello all, like she just said, my name is Glenn Coco, and as you all know, I will be the first astronaut that will be stepping on Mars, and I just want to say I am very excited to go on this expedition. You have no idea how excited I am. And um, a lot of people have been asking, why do you want to go to Mars? And what I have to say to that is, why did Columbus head west? Why did Marco Polo head east? Because it's that pull, that unknown, that prospect of adventure that compels humans to seek frontiers to explore. I want to be that human, to be the first one to step on Mars and discover if there is life on Mars. Discover what there is to learn on Mars that we could bring back to Earth. And um, there's a lot of people who agree with this expedition and a lot of people who disagree. Yes. They, I'm sorry, but um, NASA is one of them that disagrees. And you know, I, am, I have looked at the research, I have studied both sides, and I am more than convinced that going to Mars is the right thing to do. And um, I am beyond excited. I am aware of all the changes my body will go through. I know that I will have changes in blood circulation. I will be experiencing severe fatigue, back aches, um, changes with my immune system, psychological changes. And that all to me just sounds like a normal person having a bad day. And I believe that that's nothing a normal human can't withstand. And I am just beyond excited, and I would like to open it up for any questions anyone may have. Mm, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Okay, you can speak from our ears. Speaking oh. but I mean, this works too. Hi, hi, uh, my name is Nova. I am a representative of NASA. Not a legal representative of NASA. I am more of a NASA enthusiast. So um, um, my question to you is, uh, are you aware of the current research from um, University of California, Irvine, that says uh, this space travel, because of the prolonged exposure to radiation, will likely cause Alzheimer's? Um, I am aware, and as my representative will explain to you, some of that research is not really correct. The Mars Association has found that the techniques used were not accurate. There was a 4 million fold inaccuracy of the amount of radiation that was used during your research, which completely discredits the whole research. I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, this was conducted by NASA and a PhD doctor. Um, the amount was 5 centigrade to 30 centigrade, which is an appropriate amount compared to prolonged space travel, uh, according to NASA. So uh, it's pretty great. But uh, however, I'd like to point out, are you aware that the mice that they studied after being exposed to this type of radiation, it's the, uh, it simulates galactic cosmic rays that you would experience in prolonged space travel? Um, are you aware that within six weeks they were seeing severe mental side effects, um, such as inability to perform the novel object recognition test? Yes, but our astronauts are well aware of all of the risks and they are still very willing to go. Um, okay, well, uh, it's the pre-Olympic layer of the medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, they saw a decrease in the, uh, the cognitive function, um, your dendritic complexity, and uh, the, uh, the spine density also decreased. Um, are, are you aware of, of this? Are you aware of this? Security, can we get security over here? Oh wait, um, are also are you aware? Uh, there's uh, PSD95, it works with your synapses. Uh, there's a 60% increase in the function, and you know if that happens? This is the balance between inhibitory and excitatory things, like things in your brain. And, uh, security. If that gets messed up, you're, you're gonna have problems, okay? It did not show immediate effects in cognitive function, but if that happens for a long time, it will. It will. I, I have, if, if you would just, uh, if you would be willing to take some time to hear from some professionals I've brought in, uh, I think you'll agree with NASA. You know, I will 
listen to your professionals as long as they can get you away from me right now. That that will work. Does that does that satisfy you right now? Does um, that get you to go back to your seat, ma'am? Yes. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I will listen to your professionals. Hi, Tom and George. Any? We would like to close this meeting now. that I have your undivided attention and I won't be so rudely challenged, I'm just going to explain in a little bit more detail about the research that I was so generously trying to explain to you. So we're going to talk about what happens to your brain in space. So first of all, low levels of radiation and high levels of radiation elicit brain abnormalities. So Mice were tested for cognitive function using novel object recognition tests and object in place testing. The mice were then exposed to a range of 5 centigrade to 30 centigrade strength radiation. Now, this is comparable to the cosmic galactic rays that you would experience in a travel to space. I don't care what the Mars Association says. This is NASA. They know what's up. So, six weeks post-radiation. Six weeks post-radiation. Six weeks post-radiation. The mice were retested. Now, six weeks, that seems like an important thing, right? Almost like something that could potentially be the answer to a question on a final. Crazy. So six weeks post-radiation, the mice were retested to see how they performed on those same tests they were originally given, and then their brains were analyzed to see if there were any physical changes. And well, their behavior changed and their brains changed too. So when you're exposed to these galactic cosmic rays, it's going to start causing problems in your cognitive function. We saw a very, we saw a decrease in the discrimination index. It lowered by ninefold, no matter what type of radiation you were exposed to, low or high. Two types, oxygen 16, titanium 48. Again, comparable. We did see changes on the novel object recognition test as well as the object in place test. That means that we saw decreases in spatial memory retention as well as decreases in the is the function of your working memory. Now I want you to think about this for a second. If you're not able to remember what you've done a few minutes after, or why this particular object is important, you're gonna have a real hard time in a spaceship when you're hurtling a million miles an hour through space and you can't remember what you've done, or what you need to do, or why it was an important thing to do. So keep that in mind, that's one of the big concerns with these results is that when you're in space, how are you going to function if you're getting Alzheimer's? After a very short amount of time, we're seeing measurable results here. So when they started to look at the actual anatomy of the brain, they saw that the dendritic complexity was reduced as well as the spine density in the prelimbic layer of the medial free prefrontal cortex. So if you're, the spine, the synaptic spine density decreases, we know that synapses are essential to the consolidation of memory, and those start to decrease in size, you're going to have a hard time making memories and keeping them in. We saw changes, so that means since we're seeing changes in memory, that means the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. The prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. Those sound like important words, almost like words you might want to write down in case this should be answers to a test on a final answers to a question on a final. Yeah, that. <laughs> answers to a question on a final. Hippocampus, prefrontal cortex. Anyway, because we're seeing changes in that, it's going to be extremely difficult to continue to function in your spaceship. The other thing we saw was this protein called PSD95. So it increased by 60%, and what this, causing significant alterations in synaptic, synaptic proteins. So PSD95, its job is to organize and recruit proteins in the synaptic cleft. And there it has the transmission of excitatory and inhibitory balance. If you disrupt that, you're just going to have a bad time. So overall, you're seeing in a very short amount of time extreme changes in your brain. After only six weeks, we see changes in the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. And this is exactly what happens when you're looking at Alzheimer's. Other studies have shown that you actually start to see plaque buildup just like you would in Alzheimer's as well. So this is something that you need to think about. So I've brought in some experts to talk just a little bit more about the actual side effects and progression of Alzheimer's. 
I'm Dr. Beta, and I'm here to talk about how Alzheimer's changes the whole brain. Alzheimer's is a disease that leads to nerve cell death and tissue loss throughout the brain. Over time, the brain shrinks dramatically, affecting nearly all its functions. The slide shows a brain without the disease, a brain with advanced Alzheimer's disease, and how these two brains compare. Here's another view of how massive cell loss changes the whole brain in advanced Alzheimer's disease. This slide shows a crosswise slice through the middle of the brain between the ears. In the Alzheimer's brain, the cortex shrivels up, damaging areas involved in thinking, planning, and remembering. Shrinkage is especially severe in the hippocampus, an area of the cortex that plays a key role in formation of new memories. The ventricles are the fluid-filled spaces within the brain, and they grow larger. Scientists can also see terrible effects of Alzheimer's disease when they look at the brain tissue under a microscope. Alzheimer's tissues has fewer nerve cells and synapses than a healthy brain. Plaques are abnormal clusters of protein fragments that build up between the nerve cells, and the dead and dying nerve cells contain also tangles, which are made up of twisted strands of another protein. Scientists aren't absolutely sure what causes the cell death and tissue loss in the Alzheimer's brain, but the plaques and tangles are prime suspects. Uh, protein pieces called beta amyloid clump together. Beta amyloid comes from a larger protein found in the fatty membranes of surrounding nerve cells. Beta amyloid is chemically sticky and gradually builds up into plaques. The most damaging form of the beta amyloid may be in groups of few pieces rather than the plaques themselves. These small clumps may block cell-to-cell -cell signaling at synapses. They may also activate immune system cells that trigger inflammation and devour the disabled cells. Um, tangles destroy a vital cell transport system made of proteins. This electron microscope picture shows a cell with some healthy areas and other areas where tangles are forming. In the healthy areas, the transport system is organized in orderly parallel strands, somewhat like railroad tracks. Food molecules, cell parts, and other key materials travel along these tracks. A protein called tau helps the tracks stay straight. In areas where the tangles are forming, tau collapses into twisted strands called tangles. The tracks can no longer stay straight, and they fall apart and disintegrate. Nutrients and other essential supplies can no longer move through the cells, which eventually die. And then I'm going to hand it off to my associate, Dr. Amyloid. Hello, I'm Dr. Amyloid, and I'll be talking to you about the progression of Alzheimer's through the brain. As Dr. Beta said, the plaques and tangles are showing up in the brain. On the top left, it shows the brain as the earliest Alzheimer's. The top right shows mild to moderate Alzheimer's stage, and the bottom brain shows severe Alzheimer's. The blue shaded areas shown in the brain are the plaques and tangles. These tend to spread through the cortex in a predictable pattern as Alzheimer's disease progresses. The rate of progression varies greatly. People with Alzheimer's live an average of 8 years, but some people may survive up to 20 years. The course usually depends on what age they're diagnosed. So in the earliest Alzheimer's stages, before the symptoms can be detected with current tests, plaques and tangles begin to form in brain areas involved in learning and memory and thinking and planning. This area of the brain is commonly known as the hippocampus. For the mild to moderate Alzheimer's, the brain regions important in memory and thinking and planning develop more plaques and tangles than were present in early stages. These plaques and tangles spread to areas involved in speaking and understanding speech, your sense of where your body is in relation to objects around you. These people may get confused and have trouble handling money, expressing themselves, and organizing their thoughts. For people with mild to moderate Alzheimer's, the brain regions important in memory and thinking and planning develop more plaques and tangles than were present in early stages. The plaques and tangles tend to move not only in the hippocampus, but they move more towards the medial prefrontal cortex as well. These plaques and tangles all spread to the areas involved in speaking and understanding speech and your sense of where your body is in relation to objects around you. 
As a result, individuals develop problems with memory or thinking serious enough to interfere with work or social life. In reference to my notes taken in undergrad, I took a course under the direction of Dr. Chow. It was neurobiology. And he told us that prefrontal cortical lesions lead to poor performance in working memory tests. He also informed us that the hippocampus lesion performance in spatial memory. Therefore, you forget where you've been. With severe Alzheimer's, most of the cortex is seriously damaged. The brain shrinks dramatically due to widespread cell death. Individuals lose their ability to communicate, to recognize family and loved ones, and to care for themselves. As you can see in the bottom brain, it is mostly blue. All of that blue shows where there is cell death. Therefore, there is a whole bunch of cell death going on in that brain. Fun fact, genetic testing is available to tell if you have a high risk of getting uh, Alzheimer's. So there are two types of genes that can play a role in affecting whether a person develops a disease. Those are risk genes and deterministic genes. Alzheimer's genes have been found in both categories. Risk genes increase the likelihood of developing a disease but do not guarantee it will happen. Scientists have so far identified several risk genes implicated in Alzheimer's disease. The risk gene with the strongest influence is called apolipoprotein EE4, also known as ApoE4. Scientists estimate that ApoE4 may be a factor in 20 to 25% of Alzheimer's cases. Deterministic genes directly cause a disease, guaranteeing that anyone who inherits them will develop the disorder. Scientists have discovered variations that directly cause Alzheimer's disease in the genes encoding amyloid precursor protein, APP, presenilin 1, PS1, and presenilin 2, PS2. So, I just happen to have a sample of Glenn Coco's DNA provided by Noah. You're welcome. Regretfully, the results do show that you have a minor risk gene. So the choice is yours. Go and get Alzheimer's or stay and live. Hello, I am a Mars Association representative and we are here with the head astronaut of the Mars expedition and she would like to give a few words. Uh, hi everyone, my name is um, Glenn Coco and I just want to say I went to Mars, and hi everyone, my name is Glenn Coco, and I went to Mars, and did I mention my name is Glenn Coco, and um, Mars, I went there. Hi, Nova, actual legal representative for NASA. Um, I just wanted to say uh, your synapses are full of plaques and uh, NASA was right. I went to Mars.